Ooh. We're live. Are we still right. inside scoop? I'm not gonna say what edition it is anymore, but what number it is anymore. I'm just I don't... gonna say welcome this week. Okay. okay. Yeah. Well, should we just call the show this week then? <laughs> welcome to this week. <laughs> I don't know. That's not bad. Inside, scoop. That's not bad. I like that better than inside scoop this yeah. week. I don't like the inside scoop. No, inside yeah. scoop's kind of. Yeah. What about like tell it like it is? No, 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 no. no. We're, We're just gonna walk. We don't yeah. have to have it. This name. week. Yeah. yeah. Welcome back this week. There you go. All right. Okay, here we go. Uh, welcome back this week. We have uh, Winston Hansma as a guest. I'm, I'm super excited to have Winston. I've known Winston for uh, 25 years probably. And Winston's won two and a half million dollars in the fraternity and the, the derby three times. And uh, too many other things to mention. One of the best... Uh, one of the best cutting horse trainers of all time. And not just, Winston's reputation is not just as a good uh, cutting horse trainer, but also as a, as a horseman, you know, one of the true horsemen in the business, so. But, yeah. but let's, not, let's not get too far out there. The reason that you're here is because you're There's one 301. of the, you're, you're, <laughs> you're one of the people on our list that we like, that okay? That we like, all right. Because yeah. that was one of the <clears throat> criteria is we have to like you. So we like Winston. Yeah, that's that is the, for sure. If we don't like them, they're not on here. That's, that's <laughs> the real number one. We don't call them. No, we don't call. But uh, anyway, Winston is. So we're super super excited to have Winston. And you know, Winston's family is the the Hansmas in Canada are legendary. Uh, his dad was a pioneer, I would say, in the quarter horse businesses in Canada. Wouldn't you, Winston? Yeah, he was uh, very involved. He's in mm -hmm. the AQHA Hall of Fame. Yeah, sure is. He was really involved in in promoting and marketing the American Quarter Horse or Alberta Quarter Horse into Europe. Is really what he was recognized for. Yeah, Italy and, and uh, Germany. Germany. Yeah, with Johannes Ogeldinger and mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. And your whole family is uh, involved in horses, right? Uh, I have two other brothers that are cutting horse trainers as well. I've got there's there's five of us in their family, five boys. Have they been Dad. successful riding cutting horses? Yeah, they were all both in the NCHA Hall of Fame as well. No kidding. Yeah, there you go. So yeah. you're in the NCHA I was, Hall I was of the Fame. Second, I was the second handsman. Remember he called? Yeah. Paul was the first Paul one. The Paul first couldn't one. make it. Paul didn't take his call. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he never does. <laughs> he never calls me back either. So, so you and Paul, and it's Jerry, right? Yep. That's in the, in the Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. And then the other two brothers, Taco and... David. David. Yep. Do they, they run the farm, or what do they do? Well, Dave runs a, uh, an egg facility in the town that we live close to that hosts a lot of uh, uh, show, quarter horse shows and cuttings and team ropings and stuff. So and then my oldest brother, uh, he was a horseshoer, and now he's got a cattle hoof terming business. Okay. Yeah. So, so everybody has some involvement with mm -hmm. the livestock yep. anyway. Yep. What'd you guys, did you guys play any sports or anything? I know you're a big sports fan. Did anybody play any sports growing up? Well, um, I was going to say, Dad, there was five of us in there. Dad believed in a, a cheap workforce. So <laughs> yeah, sure. no, most of the time, until... until my two youngest brothers come along. Like when we went to school, it was home because we had work to do. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so we played like in in school. We played basketball and played some hockey and stuff. I think everybody played hockey up there. But um, no, we uh, um, always had more work than we could possibly get done. So kind of the way it was. In in researching your family. Did you guys know, not only is his dad in the AQHA Hall of Fame, but he bought and raised colts out of a mare named Super Poo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they, they won 750000 plus in cutting out of a mare named Super Poo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he bought her in Washington State for like, I don't know, 1500 bucks or something. That was, really? that, was, that, was, that was back in the day when 
That was back in the day when... When they just named horses after uh, feces. Yeah. That guy should... My first... You know what my very first cutting horse's name was? Uh-uh. Ride a pink horse. <laughs> ride, Seriously. Ride a pink horse. Yeah, it was raised by uh, Stanley Johnson, who owned Doc Jack Frost. And... Uh, the year that my first cutting horse was born, Stanley and his wife were getting divorced. And so it was her job to name the horses, and that's how my horse got the name, Ride a Pink Horse. And he was a buck skip. Oh, you, yeah. well, you know, I, knew, I didn't know that, what Gunny just said, but I didn't know about Super Poo. I, you know, I knew that was a big time horse in the, in the cutting horse industry. Yeah, she was a, Paul Schiller was a cow horse, a snaffle bitter, yeah. really, mostly, yeah. But and he won the non pro snap a bit derby in, in Sacramento on her when he was just, before he even knew it was that very hard to do. Yeah. He just kind of. When did you first do the cow horse stuff? Well, we kind of, um, probably like a lot of you guys, we grew, when we grew up, we started in the 4-H and then ended up going into the youth, in the, in the Quarter Horse Association. And back then, LM65, back then, I mean, we just did everything. Right. He showed halter, trail, pleasure, you know, and uh, western riding, raining. You had the jumper some, didn't you? Uh huh. Yeah. It was enjoyed that. Yeah. It I was, think you told me you went to the first ever Spruce Meadows show. Yeah, one of the very first ones. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that had to be in the late late seventies. Yeah. 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 Was... Yeah. I know knew the Southerns. You know that owned Spruce Meadows, yeah. and when they start, first started bringing the Hanoverian horses over, and oh, wow. yeah, yeah, I. I like I said, I really did enjoy riding them. I just always kind of wanted to be a cowboy. Yeah. I didn't, just didn't like wearing the clothes. But I mean, I really, it's, it's a lot of fun to do. So, oh, yeah. yeah, it was good. <clears throat> well, I think that background, you know, we've talked about that before. I think, you know, sometimes it's a disadvantage to some of the, the younger guys today that come up in an event specific, you know, to what they're doing. Like they only ride cutters. They only ride rangers. So, I think the background of having to do a bunch of other stuff makes, I think it makes a big difference. You know, I think it, it makes you a better horseman for sure. Oh yeah, no doubt. The, 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 the other advantage to, to what's happening today is, is, you know, when I started cutting, I was 30. And I thought, you know what, I've got 15 or 20 years to get good at this and hopefully make enough money that I can have something. Well now, Hell, when they're 20 years old, because they've grown up through the youth and they just do it, the learning curve is definitely condensed. I mean, mm -hmm. take Cade or, you know, all those guys. That, I mean, when they're 20, 25, you know, they don't even know it's supposed to be hard to do. Right. Yeah. You know? Back, back in, back, we, I mean, it was, I mean, you guys probably went the same thing. It was a struggle to figure out how to. To train a horse and how to show a horse. Tom and... made my life nothing but easy. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what kind of stuff. Yeah, I don't, you guys I don't are... know if you know, but Gunny worked for me. Yeah, when I knew that. Started out, so. Tom made my life yeah. nothing but easy. Yeah. All I tried to do was just boost him up, you know, build his confidence <laughs> yeah, every right. day. That's kind of, you know, encouraging. I, yeah. Encourage. Yeah. Encourage. Yeah. There, there wasn't a day. There wasn't a day at Tom McCutcheon Rain the Horses where it didn't end in a smile, okay? <laughs> <laughs> That's because he walked out of the house with a ponytail or a dreadlocks or no, something. It wasn't, huh? that, it wasn't quite that long ago. <laughs> yeah. yeah. when, when I first, first met him, that was in those days back when you were living on next door to Guy Woods. Guy Woods, yeah. 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 And then you guys sent me a couple of horses mm -hmm. to try, and, and yeah. I remember I Dual peps. Yeah, yeah. I went down there. Rejected them. I went down to the to the uh, fraternity and uh, <laughs> okay. Tell okay, no, you it. tell. I wasn't. I knew this story, but I wasn't going to say it. No, that's yeah, too about, embarrassing. About Bobby. Tell yeah, I know. He, he, he's so Tom's over there talking to us, and this Bobby Pigeon that owned Dual Pepper C D Lean and Bar H Ranch. You know, he was a he was from Memphis, Tennessee, but he was a real redneck. And he he sees us over there talking to Tom, and Tom's got a ponytail. And he says, who the F is that query you're talking to? Oh, I said, well, that's your rain horse train. So much. <laughs> got a ponytail. <laughs> uh, yeah. I wasn't going to tell that story. I thought, no, that's too embarrassing. Yeah, I wouldn't no, do that. But you went ahead and brought it up. So. No, it doesn't embarrass me one bit. Yeah, the good old days. I'm 
trying to bring it back a little bit, actually. Yeah. Yeah. I think you should. I yeah. think you should definitely grow it out. Yeah, I don't know if I'm going to go full ponytail, but, you know. I think I'll, you should go, I mean, I think it should flutter in the wind. Mm -hmm. You had dreadlocks, too, there, though, didn't it you? It feels good. When you open fast circles, it feels good, yeah. you know. Yeah. Did you not have dreadlocks, too? I, I had a form of dreadlock. Yeah. Right. Well, you had, like, beads and I stuff in it, right? Didn't you have it beaded at one time? I did have it beaded at one time. Oh, no. <laughs> Cor cornrow. Oh, no. <laughs> that's a cornrow. Just, Just a couple of Yeah, rows. that's too much. <laughs> that won't go there. Yeah. Let's not beads, get carried away. Little dreadlocks. <laughs> yeah. I'm good yeah. With. yeah. And then, you know, the cutters were very, very impressed with that. Yeah. So, yeah. you know how they are. Yeah. Well, you know, I've always... One thing I've always really been jealous of the cutters of is like when Winston and Paul were in there, I mean, they were in their heyday and I went down there to watch them work. Manny and I went down to watch them work at the Bar H. They're both working for the Bar H. And I mean, they've got it made. They got people bringing them horses. They got people put, hey, we need a couple more cows. They put a couple more cows in the round pen. And, I mean, they need nothing but get from, they ride them five minutes a piece. Yeah, they're mm -hmm. like oh, hey, 30, it's, 30 it's, by lunch. By lunchtime, they're done. And I don't know what they do. That you, we have to work as a we, as a rainer. We have to work all day long. Hey. As a cutter, I don't really know what they do after lunch. Yeah. Golf. <laughs> yeah. Golf. Yeah. And we have to get up real early, so sometimes you know we have to take a nap. You well, know. I know yeah. that is. Yeah. I don't like yeah. That. Yeah, uh, that's the downside. Yeah, and that three o'clock start in the morning, two o'clock start in the morning, you know, somewhere along the line. We've got a friend that comes over and, like, he'll show up at 10.30 in the morning in the summertime, and we might have one horse left to work. And he drives out of the yard and he phones his buddy up and he says, them some bitch don't do nothing over there. He said, <laughs> he he said I went over there, they ride one horse and that's it. Yeah. Like. <laughs> yeah, I remember I told Mandy, I said, hey, that's all right. Yeah. I mean, that looks like a pretty good gig right there, but then I was thought about the cows, cows and the, you know how I don't like cows and all the doctoring and you know I, I qualified a horse one year for the world show measles hickory was his name and uh, I qualified him for the world well here's the whole story so I'm at a show in Athens Texas getting him qualified for the world show in rain and a bunch of the guys uh, Robbie Schroeder and Bobby Lewis and a bunch of the guys were there and they said hey can you fill this cow horse class for us we need a we need a few extra horses in there to make it a big enough class. And I'm up second and qualified for the world show. And he had a cow background because I bought him from Sam Rose. So Sam cut on him his whole two-year-old year. So it's not like he'd like never seen a cow before. He was pretty broke on a cow. And he was probably five at the time. And I was qualifying for the world show. And I went in there a second. And I thought, well, heck, I'll... You know, I'll show it. This I'll is take easy. This I can is I'll take it. I called my dad and I said, hey, Pop, can I borrow like five cows? And he says, sure. He, he hauls them over and, and drops off five cows. And I think, what did it take, Mandy? Like four days and three of them were dead? <laughs> no. Yeah. I wasn't very good with cows. I don't know. Something happened from Valley View to Aubrey where those cows didn't haul. <laughs> That's not very far. <laughs> they didn't know this. Yeah, it's a good 20 minute drive. Yeah, the shipping fever. Yeah, they got the shipping <laughs> fever or something. Mm -hmm. I come out the next day and they're just all bloated and fat and laying there dead. And I was like, yeah, you know, I don't, I don't remember why I don't do this cow stuff. So anyway, I had to get ready with just two cows. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was a little bit worried. That's, that's good that your passion didn't stop there. No, 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 I, I had to be ready, you know. And uh, in, in the end of the day, I never did pay my dad back for those cows, and I was terrible at the world show. Oh, you so, actually showed. Oh, I showed. Nice. Yeah, yeah. The, the lights of Oklahoma City is a little bit different than <laughs> Athens, Texas. Yeah. Uh, there was no pressure at Athens, and then I qualified, and all of a sudden I thought I was good. So, <laughs> you did better yeah. than I did in Athens, Texas, in the cow horse. I, I, I fell off. I almost fell off on my first turn. So I, I called it quits right then and there when I blew both stirrups and I was scared to death. So yeah. you, you did better than I did, Tom. I, I, I applaud you for, you know, you at least, you at least got through that one run in Athens. I didn't yeah. even get through that run in Athens. Yeah. Well, you know, and the thing is, I, I was a little bit nervous about the cow horse because I grew up. I always had to turn, like you, we'd get off the school bus and you'd have, from a young age, we'd have to go turn back for dad. And, he always had my pony saddle, and I had a little pony. It didn't matter. If that cow got by me, 
that little pony put his ears back and ran after that stuff thing. And eight out of ten times, he turned that cow and I'd fall off. <laughs> eight out of ten freaking times. And I had no control of that cow would get by me, and I just hold. <laughs> I was like, you ever see the monkey oh, and the dog? Yeah, yeah, the yeah, yeah. The yeah. That was me. He goes going down there, and that thing had turned. Wham, down I go. So I was a little bit nervous about that to begin with, but I got through it. Tom, Tom said he had a little pony. He said, oh, it was my little pony. Did you hear the, the sentiment in there? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like that little pony. I like, speaking of names, so there, we had a... We had a horse in our industry that Craig Schmuckle showed, and they called him Pookie. But that wasn't what he should have been called, right? You guys had, was it you or Paul that had a horse? It should have been Poo, Poo, it was short for Poo Q. Yeah. Yeah. Poo yeah. It was a Doc Coyote, I think. Yeah. Out of Super Poo. Yeah. Yeah. When you Pookie stand. was out and of Kirk Super Poo? That he showed that horse. horse. Was that yeah. one out of the same air? Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. That thing showed forever. And they called him <coughs> Pookie. Right. But I always knew that. Hmm. Because of these guys, I always knew that wasn't his name. His whole life, that's what they knew him as. But his name was, it was supposed to be Pookie. Yep. No, my, uh, talking I just, about... I just talk applaud you guys for owning a horse named Super Poo. Like, my dreams are crushed knowing that that name is taken and I can't use it myself. Yeah, she was by a uh, horse called um, Pima Country, who was by Parker's Trouble, and out of a daughter hobby horse. That's how she's bred. You, you know the other thing I really admire about the cutters, though, when we're talking about cows and stuff, is when we go horse show, if it doesn't go right, it's our fault. Cutters, if they go in there and doesn't show, I drew, I drew a bad cow. Yeah. My turn back out. That guy didn't get over there. Yeah. They steered me on the wrong cow. Oh, you guys got lots of excuses. Huh. Don't tell me no, that. We don't. Hey, <laughs> oh, yeah. The judges. <laughs> well, yeah. We yeah. all have that. Yeah. Everybody's right. got all that. Right. We all have that. Yeah. But come on. Hey, there is a lot of variables. Okay. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. No doubt. That, but you know what? I think most guys that do well, if they did cut a bad cow, they think, you know what? I was holding the bridle reins. Well, I, you know what? I heard you tell a story, though, about... Um, earlier but when you were first starting out listening to all the guys that you know you got to cut a cow like this or that kind of cow like that you know tell that story oh there was a, there's been a lot of changes you know through the years with cutting like we were talking about the learning curve um you know nowadays a lot of guys that are trainers they kind of grow up in the industry and they show through the youth and they just do it but back when I started, we had to learn how to ride different. You know, I, just, I came from a quarter horse background, so you had stiff legs and stiff upper back. And, you know, you had to learn to ride more relaxed. And, and um, then when we started to cut cows, when I first moved down here, you just cut. Just whatever stopped, you cut it. And then eventually they figured out, you know, because of the herds. It start, used to be they'd cut five, they'd put 15 head of cows in and work five horses. And then over a period of time, that after, when I moved down here, they would put in bigger herds. And then people realized that if you cut a, a cow that had been cut already, it wouldn't be as good. So then we started watching the cattle a lot closer. And uh, they, uh, you know, I'd listen to Bill Freeman and that talk about how you have to cut a cow. And I mean, it was pretty intricate. I mean, you had to kind of evaluate the kind of cow and then you'd decide what position you'd want to be in to cut that type of particular type of cow. And I probably ch chased more cows around Will Rogers back in the herd as many as anybody did. And uh, then when I decided, you know what, I'm just going to walk in there and drive the stupid cow out I, I want. And simplified it, it worked out just fine, you know? And that's kind of what we do today. So do you think, from somebody that doesn't know, do you think that the majority of the guys cut... How many people just cut for shape? Does anybody oh, hardly anybody anymore. Shape? Hardly you anybody. Cows hardly anymore. anybody anymore. Even in the amateur classes, most of them 
Always picking cows. They, they, cows they, they, yeah, they, they cut cows that they want. And everybody's gotten pretty good at it. I, I don't even, even, even the amateur people. I don't even understand what cutting for shape is. Like the shape of the cow, like, ooh, that's... No, the cool last guy. cow. The last cow that stops out there, you know. And that's usually what we did do. You'd, gotcha. you'd bring a group of cows out. And, you'd and you'd, if, the if they were rolling to the left, you'd walk over there and stop the flow. Yep. And then the cow would come back to your right, and then maybe you'd stop the flow here again. And then eventually, they, when they, the way they started flowing back to the herd, if, the, if a cow stopped and stood in front of you, that would be the cow you cut. Gotcha. That and most, and most people, yeah, and most people, they weren't aware if that cow was a fresh cow. I'm sure Buster Welsh did. I'm sure Matt Lockrose did. I imagine the real, real good guys, they knew. But most of us, they did. We didn't know. We just you guys went down there. Up. We just cut, you know. The guys that grew up around cattle their whole lives. And well, like the real good, the guys that were winning. Yeah. Yeah. So when you're in the finals and they're settling that herd, do you go yourself? Like I know at Will Rogers, a lot of guys sit up at the top and watch them settle. Do you go yourself or do you have somebody go for you to watch Oh, no, cows? you definitely watch cows yourself. And you like I said, you're holding the bridle range. You need to be, you're the one who's responsible. Yeah. Now your helps are with you. And, um, you know, if you're deep in a bunch, you have a list and, you know, say if there's 65 ho cows in, in that herd and you're 12th or 13th in there, you'll have 30, 40 head of cows written down. And as they're cut, being cut, you cross her. You know, you have a list of blacks, a list of charlets, a list of reds. How do you, you know? decipher one cow that looks exactly like another cow? Then none of them look exactly alike. Yeah, they're they're little, okay. There'll be a little mud specks. There'll be okay. a straw. You know, I mean, it gets real detailed. Okay. Yeah, white, it gets really, hair, really detailed. And that's why, you, that's why you got the corner help is they know what cows you're looking for. Gotcha. And so when you're, when you're working, they'll, uh, they'll be kind of... When you're peeling, looking, when they're you're not peeling. watching you. They're not watching you for the most part. Probably work or showing your horse. They're already trying to find that next cow for you, and they'll say, "Hey, that black cow with the three hooks in the tail. She's you know over there towards Paul on the back fence." And so you yeah, just, that was my next. Yeah, and then so you yeah. ride back in there yeah. and yeah. Yeah. So when, before you walk into the herd, then if you're you know fifth in the set or sixth in the set, you get together with your guys. And you say, okay, this one's been used, this one's been used, uh, you want No, you, you, well, you don't really talk about what's been used, you talk about what you what want to cut. Yeah. yeah. And some guys, like, like back when I used to help Matt Gaines a lot, he used to amaze me because he could, he had such focus, like, we talk, I'd help him out of the herd, and we talk about what we're going to cut. Well, when he walked into that herd, if the cows we talked about just didn't act right, he could look at 20, 25 head of cattle, and sort out out of those 20 or 25, what had been cut, what hadn't been cut, are the ones that hadn't been cut, cut, which one was in the best spot to cut it. And he might cut something else. Lots of times he would cut something else. But he could process that all in my mind. I'm like, whoa. Because I'm, I'm pretty, that didn't work so well for me. I was more or less, you know, I could audible a little bit, but normally I'd try to cut pretty much the cows we talked about. Well, I mean, I look up to Matt Gaines as a great cutting horse trainer, too, but he has been dodging me and Tom on a ping pong match for four or five years. At least, yeah, probably at least four years. Four years? Yeah. I mean, he's been, he's been a no-show. He's probably been practicing then. We don't need to practice. <laughs> yeah, no, we're, you know, I don't think, I just don't see any, I don't think the cutters have the same athleticism as a group. It's a different level. It's a different when level. When it comes to the ping pong. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, how? Yeah, you guys' physical conditioning on the most part really show that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah they, you show a lot of it's, athletic. Hey, it's yeah. not. Yeah, it's, the two of you guys with the poster shot. Yeah. It's a Fitness. It's about it's yeah. about your fast twitch muscles. Ping yeah. pong yeah. is. It's not a marathon. Yeah. It's about the fast twitch muscles. Uh, yeah, watching the ball. Yeah. But yeah. well, we yeah. didn't think, we didn't back down from the challenge. He just hasn't showed up here. Yeah, that's my point. No. Yeah, no. Uh, well, I'm sure it's just a timing thing. Matt Gaines and Brendan Clark. Yeah. Yeah, they were going to come yeah. and, and neither one of them. They've had some opportunities. Yeah. No show. No they probably had a better offer. No. Well, not not a better offer I, playing ping pong here. I mean, no, well. Think, any offer is better than, you know, getting your ass kicked up here. So, yeah. mm. so when you, before, when you were going back to your cow story, the only good story I got that I think is kind of funny is 
I went back to the Snaffle Bit show in 2010, and I had a mare that I was trying to sell. She was a Meekum Blue out of a seed yielding in Maryland. And she was a big mare, and I tried to sell her all summer, just never got anybody. People had bid me on her, and I really wasn't wanting to take her, take that for her, you know? And so I went, I went back, and I thought, you know, I always wanted to show it snap a bit. So I entered up, and I drew up early in, in the rain work. So I didn't really get an opportunity to watch everybody. And I'd watched lots of rain, and I showed rain and horses, you know, back in the quarter horse thing, you know? And so to start with, before I went into the, the ring, I, I never really counted my turnarounds. You know what I mean? I just thought it was three and a half each way. I thought, well, you, need, you can count, count three and a half turns each way, you know? But I also was working on, you know, when you ride a cutter, it's more direct rain. So we get a lot, lot, lot more bend. And I've been really working on not doing that, all right? And so half an hour before I'm going to show, I'm getting ready to go show or go, getting back in the back there warming up. And I think, well, I need to count my turnarounds. So, I realized that if it started out good, it was easy enough. But if it didn't start out real good, <laughs> by the time I got things why I wanted them, I had absolutely no idea how many times I turned around already. You know, so I'm turning, and I'm turning, and I'm turning, and I'm turning. And Board Rice comes up to me. He says, "What are you doing?" And I said, "I can't turn my turnarounds." He said, "Don't worry about everything else." He said, "Just pull on that direct rein." And he said, "Just count three and a half. You'll be fine." And so that's what I did. But then I go in there and show. All right, and when I showed in quarter horse shows, we, we did the figure eights. We went across on the diagonal and changed our leads. This mare changed leads good, but on the diagonal, not close the circle up, you know? So I get done and somebody <clears throat> says to me, they go, those are old fashioned figure eights you made. And I go, well, when the heck did they ever change the shape of an eight for crying out loud? <laughs> <laughs> and then the part I forgot to mention before, when I got there, somebody says, how's your raining? And I said, well, considering I'm doing the same things I did 30 years ago, how do you think my raining's going to be? <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah, I remember you had a little, as I recall, you had a little trouble with your oak departures, too. Um, no, I just had, I had more trouble with my speed. Because what I thought was fast was not very fast. Because <laughs> that's... Danny, she says to me, she says, you could have loped a little fat, ran a little harder. And I go, are you kidding me? I thought my hat was going to blow off. I was going, going so fast. fast. So I looked at the video and it's like, no, I was just in the high lope. <laughs> you made the division finals, though, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, I did get I made the intermediate and limited finals. Yeah. 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 I think that had more to do with the competition than me. Yeah. No, well, I don't think so. I'm but, that's it. That's it. And I remember when he called me. I was, oh my gosh, I was laughing because you, we know that's always, almost always, why somebody overspins or underspins in our deal. They start to take a bad step. Yeah, that first step, then you count yeah. one. Yeah. How many times you do that? You step. Uh, come on. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, where am I? Yeah. You've already gone through four. Yeah. Yep. No, it 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 really had me rattled before I went in there. I was like panicked. I was panicked back there, because I was like, I can't count. And I mean, I really, really thought, why do you need to count? I mean, before that, I mean, like, three and a half each way, how hard's that to do? Yeah. yeah. So, doing, doing some, doing a little research, trying to get caught up with Winston Hansma, came across the YouTube video of him winning the fraternity in 1994 on CD Arena. Awesome run, by the way. It was Thank cool. You. It was cool to see, even though it's 25 years later. It's very neat to see. Had his chap zipped all the way down to his boots. Canadian style. Oh, is that no, Canadian? No, is that really? no, no. A lot of guys do that hands? now. No, a lot of guys do that now. Now I was a trendsetter. That's all. You don't, you don't recognize me as a trendsetter. That's all. Had the chap zipped no. all the way down to the boots. I was at that. Yeah. I was at that. But no, a lot of guys do now. Yeah. Yeah. That but that was guy. back in the days of a lot of guys still wore back wings. So yeah, yeah. I was at that cutting, and were you in the first set or the second set? First set, seventh horse. Yeah. yeah, you were midway through the first set, and I and I, I mean, I remember it clear as day. I was standing on his left as he was cutting, and there was, I mean, that when he was done, you might as well have went home because the feeling was that nobody was going to beat that run. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, that run was that good. I mean, they marked it at 25. You mark it whatever you want. Yeah. I mean, that run was... And I don't know nothing about cutting, but I, I was watching it going, man, they only marked it at 25? Cause that was seen, a big score back then. Yeah, but you, I've seen some of the recent uh, mm -hmm. shows where they're marking horses 230s, and, man, it looked like it fit right along in with those, they, and it's 25 years later. Mm -hmm. No, they're, they've gotten, they, they've loosened up this, the scoring, which is good. Yeah. You know what I mean? It, they're, you know, it used to be, uh, like I said, 75 was pretty much uh, as good as you could mark in, in, in Fort Worth. What and uh, CD Alina. Oh, he was he was a phenomenal horse. He was a real full of himself. He was like uh, one of them studs that never pays attention to nothing. You know what I mean? Slinging his head, looking all over, and nickering at this. And I mean, he was. But the minute you put him on a cow, he just channeled all that energy at the cow, and that's what made him unique. You know. But he was he was a phenomenal two year old. I mean. Paul and I are probably one of the last two fraternity champions to ride the horses they won the fraternity on all the way through their two-year-old year. Like we, back in them days, we just did it, you know. But um, he was a phenomenal two-year-old already. Yeah. Yeah, that, that was impressive. I mean, that, like I, I remember, I, and we were friends then, and and uh, I just remember, like I wasn't even. That nervous, I wasn't even concerned that anybody was going to beat him because it was just, it took the air a little bit out of the building because it was just that good, you know, I mean, I mean, it was super, super cool to watch, I can remember. So we're at the sale earlier that day, and I'm with Dean Latimer and a couple other guys that wanted to meet, you know, the, the Hansma boys are, you know, big time, they're players, and they wanted to meet. Winston, so I walk him over there and I said, Hey, I want you guys to meet. So but I introduced there and said their names, and then I said, And this is Paul Hansom's brother. <laughs> you remember that? <laughs> uh, he, he was all puffed up, and then I said, This is Paul Hansom's brother. Oh, you son of a bitch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You remember that? Mm -hmm. yeah. That's all right. People said that before <laughs> and after. Paul was one of them like child prodigies. Like when he showed um, Super Poo, I mean, he just he just went to win. I mean, he just got him down the ring and picked the reins up, and she just drag it. You know, I mean, he just Paul's always been. I mean, he's just one of them naturals. You know that. He looks. So I had to work a little harder at it. He looks super smooth to me when yeah. he's showing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just super smooth. No, he's what got a lot of feel for a horse, and like I said, if he wanted to snap a bit, he kind of quit. But you know, he just has a lot of natural feel and things come really easy to him just like when we give clinics like like you know people that it comes that natural to they they don't really remember how and why you did things you just do it you know <clears throat> well me i could remember exactly why i did it and where i put this leg and where i put that leg and where i pick, picked up on this rain because all that process i had to process all that to to sort through it all right so but, I, kind of uh, have that. I, I understand where you're coming from. I have that problem too. <laughs> just too talented to know, you know yeah. what I'm doing. <laughs> you just have that. You can't explain it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just do it. Yeah. I just explain that that dumb look in your face. Was. <laughs> uh -uh. <laughs> yeah. It was. Just, it was just high. It was just a high talent level. And that's, not, that's not what I was getting out of it. That dumb look at his face was just. He was in his he was zone. So talented. I was in my zone just doing yeah. my thing to try to have me explain it or, you know, it was, it was hard for me. You, you know, one thing, too, that I think <clears throat> it's, it's not related to the horse tra training, but I think for a lot of people out there that train horses now, one thing that impressed me, too, about you, and I'm curious how you did it, you... You and I have done some business together. We've done some real estate deals together and stuff. You are also, I mean, you've done well financially outside of just training horses. And I see, I think we've all seen in our industry a great lesson how many old horse trainers are, you know, broke. Mm -hmm. And I think it's something we've all talked about. Let's not do that yeah, because sure. that, you know, that, that's a good lesson. Let's be careful. But I think... 
you know, that, that really always, to me, is I had a lot of respect, not for just what you want, but for obviously a good businessman, too. What was your strategy? I don't know if I had strategy, but just survival, you know, like, um, you know, we, when we moved to Weatherford, and, you know, it wasn't till I got there and, and um, started having some success showing that I actually had any money to do anything different with, and we happened to live across the street from the guy that Matt Gaines worked for, and his name was Charles Spence. He's the guy that had Strike King Lures. He was a real successful businessman, and, you know, he just kind of, uh, you know, got me, you know, partnered with me on some property around there and stuff, you know, like he just was one of those guys, and, you know, I recognized that, you know, this was a, we always kind of did low maintenance kind of investment, so it wasn't no improvements or anything like that, but we just kind of were fortunate enough to get into the, you know, when Weatherford was just starting to take off. And, um, you know, I was always more interested, even when I was a bar H, I was more interested, as interested or more interested in, in how to run the ranch and promoting the studs and running the program. It just, I always, I, I just never, I never really intended to be as much of a horse trainer as I ended up being, <laughs> to be honest with you, you know, just because, uh, um, you know, as it, as it progressed along, I just kind of got more and more interested in, in the horse training end of it, but um, I just always enjoyed the being able to run the whole program, and, and like I said, Charles Spence was probably the one as far as getting involved in the, in the flipping properties that you know, he was probably as responsible as anybody of, of getting me kind of directed over that in that direction. Yeah, and, yeah. I, and I know you've, you've done well on those. Yeah. And I know, you know, you and I did a couple of deals together back in the day when I, I found the deals, but I didn't have the money. And I called Winston and he financed the deals and we were partners on them. And, you know, the first deal, first deal I get him into was a big deal. I mean, it was, it was a lot of money. And it was, we decided, okay, we're not going to sell this, we're not going to flip it right away. We're going to, we're just going to clean it up a little bit, hang on to it a little bit so we can, you know, get cap sell it. When we sell it, we can uh, get capital gains on it. And uh, in that time while we were waiting, the whole world crashed. That was the stock market crash in, of uh, 08. And I was like, my first deal with one of my buddies and I'm going to lose his money. And as it turned out, we bought a, you know, we bought a good enough piece of land worth the money. And it was, it was the first piece. I remember coming out of that deal, my, re my realtors told us it was the highest, it was the first over million dollar piece of land that sold in Denton County coming out of that wreck. So we, we ended up good on it. And, and I made you money on that deal. And we did one other deal. And yeah, they both were good. Yeah, we both made Second money. deal was a little better. Yeah. <laughs> But <laughs> I even made a little money he, on Tom on that he one. He took advantage of me a little bit, <laughs> I gotta say. He did, he did take advantage of me a little bit, but... I tormented him a little. <laughs> yeah, and he's, you know, he's not afraid to, to let you know every time he sees you. But I also know that, you know, I know he's cheap, which is not a bad thing. Frugal. Frugal. Yeah, there you go. That's Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Yeah, 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 there's a difference. Me the same yeah, thing. Right? yeah. You're cheap. No, it's frugal. Yeah. yeah. So I think it's probably a combination of. I, I mean, did you did you, so, <clears throat> did you take a certain amount of your winnings? Did you did you have a certain amount of the money you made and allocate it somewhere else, or did you just did, did you just survive and and then you know buy a couple of pieces of land and flip them and? Uh, well, I always would take partners for one thing for the most part for a long time and like with Charles and stuff like he kind of did what you and I did I mean he he'd kind of you know buy the property and I'd be a like a half or a third partner and I'd pay into it as, as I you know could afford to you know there was kind of a pretty casual agreement you know right. and um, so it was pretty non-complicated just happened to all work out and and um, I wish I could tell you there was a, a formula that we used. It was just, uh, you know, it happened to be 
good timing. You know, I don't think it was a good time because I was smarter than anybody else. It was just good timing because it was just I've, happened to happen to happen. You know, I've done enough and, business with you. I know you're <laughs> you're smarter than a lot of them. Believe me, I, I understand that. Now, and I just think it's a I think it's a cool success story. I mean, I love when guys work and it and it works out for them. I mean, I love to to always hear those financial success stories, not just. You know, it does. So it's great if you won a million, two million, three million bucks. That's great. But you know, if you're 55 or 60 years old and you know you're you're living in a trailer house and you can't afford to pay the electric bill, then you know I think we always have that discussion. What's success? What is success? At the end of the day, is success winning a a ton of money and not having any left or is success winning a little money and having a lot of money left you know I mean that's always the question and I mean you did both I mean you were super successful as a horse trainer and super successful as a businessman and I think that's kind of a, a rarity especially in those days because I think now opportunity is a lot greater to, to make money in these industries than it was then you know, at least the reining horse business. You know, the reining horse business has, for the last several years, been phenomenal. And, uh, you know, even through all this COVID stuff, which is, um, you know, really slowed down movement, people, they're still, I mean, we still get calls daily about people looking for horses. So it's, for the reining horse business, it's been great. How, what's the cutting horse business like? Well, there's still some horses moving. I'd say it's, it, it, it has had, effect, ha, had, had a, an effect on, on, on the industry just because trainers that specialize more in weekend type show horses, they've had a lot of horses go home. Um, people can't fly out to, to look at a horse. Um, there's still some horses moving. I think the top end of the industry, if a horse comes up for sale, um, is still marketing, but it's had it's had an effect for sure. Any and I don't I don't see it re turning around real quick because the oil industry is so bad, and we have a lot of people in the cutting that playing with money that they they get out of the oil business. So I think it's gonna it's had an effect there too, and probably will for a little while. But um, you know what we we've, we've we've lived through the good times and. You know, I don't see it for the most part. I, I remember what it was like to, to have to do a lot of things I didn't normally thought maybe I'd kind of outgrown, so I'm sure we'll be fine. Yeah. Yeah. What about the cutting deal, the cutting business in the last 25 years, let's say since you won the fraternity till now? What changes do you see, uh, not only in the horses, but how many people are involved or is there more people involved or is the shows bigger or is there well i think our our problem is is i don't think we have a lot more people cutting than we're cutting 25 years ago we've kind of stayed at that 12 5 to 15,000 members mm -hmm. and um there's a lot more guys out there that can uh train and show a horse when i got involved in the industry there was a group of guys that were horse trainers could train a horse and there was a group of guys that could show a horse and there was only a handful of guys that could do both kind of like the and now there's a hundred of them yeah. and so that you know in in 94 and through you know the early 2000s if you wanted to buy a uh, good limited age to event non-pro caliber horse, not an open horse, non-pro caliber horse. If you didn't have sixty to seventy-five thousand to spend, you couldn't you couldn't buy a horse. You could find a horse that maybe was going to end up being that good, but there was some work to be done on. So you bought a horse that had some potential, but wasn't there yet. Today, that same caliber horse. If you phoned somebody and you told them you had a non-pro caliber four or five year old horse. You can't hardly get them to come look at them. And because everybody wants an open horse, because they know it's gotten that tough even in their non-pro and amateur, yeah. they want a horse that, they don't want a non-pro caliber horse. So 
Um, that horse today that we used to get sixty to seventy five thousand for is now worth about twenty to twenty five. And it costs a heck of a lot more money to get them there, but it's supply and demand, really. But I think I think we're, you know, the, the problem we've had with cutting is is we really haven't had good leadership. And I think the new man they hired that come from the Snaffle Bit Association, the Rain Cow Association, Jay Winborn, I think he has probably the most potential of anybody we've had in a long time to kind of get things turned around. We still have lots of people that want to cut. We have. 155 and six year old show. We, at one show, we'll have 155, just five and six year olds in the open. And that's dropped some in, in years just because it's gotten so tough. Mm -hmm. And we'll have 250 in the four year old. Wow. So we have lots of entries. We charge a big enough entry fee. But somewhere or another, I don't really know how the accounting works, but some reason or another, it doesn't. If it, that money doesn't end up in the payout in the cuttings, yeah. and 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 there's like I said, there's still, and I think Jay will get that turned around because he'll he, he you know he he's got a lot more. He's got a good got a good feel part. for the industry, and and um, he understands the horse business, and I think uh, like I said, we there we have a big upside. You know, it's still good. It just probably not as good as it could be. Yeah, yeah we got. And, it. You know, I think in, it, there's similar, there's parallels between absolutely. that and us. You know, I can remember back in the late '80s, early '90s, there was Tim McQuay, Bob Loomis, Craig Johnson, Bill Horn. Um, I'm missing some guys. There's there was five guys, six guys. They didn't fall off their horse. They were making the finals. I mean, I, I, I remember Craig Johnson one time running down towards the end gate and said, whoa, and his horse threw its head straight up in the air and went another 30 feet, and he rolled it back and went the other way. Well, now you're dead. You're done. I mean, that's not, you cannot, you won't get out of the first go around. And back then they could survive that, you know? Um, I looked, somebody, Posted on uh, one of our ratings, Raining 101 or one of the sites, that some scores from way back in the day. And it's not, it's so strange to look at because it was 206, 208, 207, 211, 221, 207, 206. It's not like that anymore. Yeah. It's 221, and there's 10 of those, and then 220s, and then 219s. And I mean, it's gotten so tough. I mean, you used to be, you'd, there'd be a special horse at the fraternity every year. And one, I mean, you'd see that one, you all, I, I don't know how we're going to get by that one. And now there, there's a whole pen full of them. You're warming up at night thinking, wow, how am I going to get by that horse and that, what am I even doing here? You know, I mean, there's so many horses that can plus one every maneuver. And, you know, obviously it still comes down to getting them shut. They don't. When they walk in the show pen, they don't. But the, the talent level and the, the ability of the horses and the trainers is, is a lot better than it used to be. And so much deeper. And the quality of horses. Quality of yeah. horses. Yeah. Like we've really seen that in our industry. When I moved here in 87, the majority of horses were out of a mare that she might have some breed behind her, like Super Poop. But no and show record. Name. Yeah. I mean, she, she, <laughs> but name but no... Uh, but I mean, no show record, and they still made really nice horses, you know. Yes. But nowadays, if you go down through the finalists, they're all out of a mare that had a, a was a, were big show horses or big producers or very few of the horses. You look at the, the dam side, you go, I wonder what mare that is or what that horse that is. Or the bloodline, the breeding's taken such a big step well, we forward. Had, yeah, you know, yeah. We, had, we used to, you used to see me that all the time down at the cutting fraternities buying horses, you know, uh, Little Rough Peppy, the son of uh, Little Peppy, Smart Starbuck, the son of Grace Starlight. I mean, we, I, I had a lot of success with a lot of cutting bred horses early on, but we've just, our horses have just advanced beyond that, you know. I mean, our breeding, the breeding was fairly new back in the day. I remember when I first moved down here, I went down to Bill Freeman's to look at some horses. And uh, we just stopped in. We just popped in. We didn't call them, you know. I mean, there was no cell phones back then. 
So I knew where he lived, so we just popped in. How do you think that went? <laughs> a couple of rainers <laughs> stopping in. That was in Bill Freeman's peak, you know. Yeah, we, we might have been, we might, we might as well have been like 4-H people to him. I mean, like he didn't even, <clears throat> I met him, but he, did, he didn't say a word to me, you know. I mean, he just didn't have any time for him. No knock against Bill. He was busy and had a million other things going on that made him a lot more money than talking to some moron from Wisconsin, you know, that just moved down here. And uh, so I'm not, I'm not certainly not putting any blame, but that's how much now a rainer can roll in. And not only are we not, well, we might still be morons, but we're at least, you know, we can roll in anywhere now. And I think the raining is, is a respected discipline, even amongst, I, I'm friends with a lot of cutters and vice versa. And I think, um, you know, the respect level going both ways is, well, I think everybody appreciates how much work goes into winning at any yeah. discipline right. at a high level. Yeah. You know, I don't care if it's raining, cow horse, cutting, pleasure, whatever. It, it takes a lot of effort to be able to put a winning performance together. Yeah. Yeah, it really does. Without at a high level. High, yeah. At a high level. Without a doubt. Yeah. So now the horses that you're riding now compared to, like the two-year-olds compared to like 20 years ago, how are the talent levels so much different? How many of them is it, you know, that you're calling just because of their, you know, minds or like, are most of them just talented enough to do it and you, they just can't quite handle yeah, as far as the training or when, when there, you, there you certainly calling? are a whole lot easier to do anything with today. You know what I mean? As far as training, they're easier to halt or break. They're easier to trim the first time. I mean, the horses are just a lot easier to train. For one thing, I mean, back when I moved down here, Ellie, so a lot of them horses took 45 minutes of loping just so you could work it at home. Now, well, like Tom said, hell, you know, within 30 minutes from the time we got them settled, they're loped and worked and done with, you know, because they only take 10 or 15 minutes at the very most, and they're ready to go to work. Um, you know, it's still really hard to come up with a really tough open caliber horse that's capable of winning with you know they're just you know there's so many soundness trainability you know Which in our deal you know we we want to you some of the things you guys don't want is a is a big deal in our part in our event we like a, we want a horse to think and anticipate right you know and uh <clears throat> So there's plenty of horse, there's horses that do have the talent, but they're not very smart about a cow. And, you know, they'll misread a cow and have misses. And, you know, so, you know, it's, like when it's you, still very challenging to, to come up with a, with a good open horse that's capable of winning. When do you start feeling that when you're going, ah, this one's not quick enough minded? You know, and when do you start making your calls? And you well, that? I always say you can tell the bottom 20% within about six months. And you can tell the top 20% in about six months. And the other 60%, you have to go through the motions until fraternity time and go show them. Like and, and they give horse trainers a bad name because the owner go, because if they don't turn out, they're like, well, why didn't he say something earlier on? It's like, you know as well, I mean, you guys ridden enough horse. There's plenty of them that feel like they, if they could just help you a little more there, it's there, you know what I mean? Well, you said and, it to me one but, time. I remember that, uh, and this this is what made it, I mean, perfect sense to me. We were talking on the phone, and he said, you know, the difference between your horses and our horses, our horses have to, that we want them to think, like, if he has a miss, the next time the great ones will correct their own miss. We want our horses to be forgiving and to not think. You know, we're breeding horses that, that we really don't ever want to outthink you, which personally, I think it's part of the reason there's more guys now that can train one because, and you guys are much younger than I, than Winston and I, but, and I'm much younger than Winston to be clear, but <laughs> back in the day, if you made a mistake on one, they remembered it. If you made a mistake sometimes in, the, in your training process, a lot of times that sets you back a long way, or it was the not recoverable. And now our horses are so forgiving, and I think that's made it in the raining. 
that's made a lot bigger group of people that can train them because people, you know, all, all of these, you know, the gunners and the, you know, a lot, which is the best, obviously been the most dominant breed in our sport for the last 10, 15 years. You know, I think they've allowed guys to learn as they train because they're super forgiving. Yeah. You know, you can make mistakes and they, and, and they allow you to make those mistakes. You have to make that mistake 10 days in a row before it starts to make a difference, you know. And I think that's a big, that, that's really what our industry has seen. Mm -hmm. Because of breeding. Because of breeding. Yeah, yeah we want, yeah. we just keep breeding the ones that, that don't outthink you to the ones that don't outthink you, and then pretty soon we got a bunch of them <laughs> that yeah, just can't think, it. can't think of anything. Yeah, so. Well, you're things. saying you want the opposite. You want that horse to know it's, know it's Our horses get it's better. The more we show ours, yeah. to a point, the better they get. Like if you took a, a horse and showed it at the Faturi and then didn't show it again for a year, you'd be so far behind every, all the rest of that group of horses. Because all them other horses have probably showed 30 times in between there. And they're just that much smarter and that much they can ride them that much stronger across a cow and call on them that much harder. And you guys is almost the opposite, you yeah, know. Right. For sure. And um, um, yeah, we, we, we need a horse, just like Tom was saying. Like if, if we're, we're showing a horse, like a real good horse, in a run and he misreads a cow, and you kick him over there to get back where he's supposed to go, a real good horse, I don't care how bad the cows are, they're not going to make a mistake again in that run, you know, because they, they, they figured that out. So um, that's a unique thing about, what, unique thing about cutting horses is, is, you know, we can show them quite a bit more than you guys can. Heck, we can have our amateurs get on there and practice on them yeah. You know, three, four, five days in a row, and then you work them a couple of times. And if they're a decent horse, you know, you can't take a, uh, a, a not a horse that wants to to be good and and get them turned around that quick. But um, it just takes a couple of works, and they're kind of back. Now, if they show them and they show them poorly, then it might take a few times you showing them to get them back. Not thinking that they can kind of get away with what they did, yeah, yeah. But so, I mean, going going back to the pedigree and you guys going to the sales. I mean, the pedigree and the the breeding has developed so much in cutting horses that they're trying to get them to anticipate and think for themselves. Do you think that you could do now what you guys used to do? Go to the cutting fraternity, buy a couple, not premier bred horses, and train them to be great reigning horses. I do not. No, Our don't. horses are way too busy to be a rain horse. Like, I mean, they're now, just busy. Now. Oh, yeah. I mean, if you got a horse that's a really good cutter, I mean, if, if they're loping around, something bangs beside them, they're going to jump. You know what I mean? They're going to spook at it. Well, or, you know what I mean? They're just, they're busy kind of horses, like you know. Like a border collie compared yeah. to. Yeah, and, and when you're talking about thinking and anticipate, it's not really, I mean, I don't want anybody to think, I want people to understand, it's, those horses are just bred to, to, to cow. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and they're and they're and thinking, anticipating because they're that much more. It's like a a border collie or a bird dog or whatever. It's bred into them to, you know. It's our job as trainers to bring that out in that those characteristics out in them. But it's nothing that we can we can manufacture. It's that that, that we can't take if the if if those characteristics are in, aren't in that horse like. A really good cutting horse, or a horse with lots of cow, naturally wants to get away from that cow. And it's our job as a trainer to teach that horse to stay up and hold it. Now, if we take a horse that, that we're always trying to get knocked off a cow because they don't have enough cow in them, well, you might get them trained, but you're not going to beat anybody on them, yeah. you know? So um, that thinking and anticipating has to do with the cow that's bred into them. Well, the only reason I ask is because our deal, reigning horses, has a lot of programs where our high money event deals you have to they have to be paid in and nominated by studs mm -hmm. that are primarily reigning bred. I mean, there's a few cow horses in there that leave the door open, but you hear a lot of people say, "I used to go to the cutting fraternity and buy this horse and that horse, and I did very well with them." And 
that's why I was asking, just to see if you could make it work now, you know. Uh, and, I, and I used to do it as much as anybody. Yeah. I mean, I spent a lot of time at the cut and sales and bought a lot of and had a lot of success, you know. And I had, you know, I bought some horses from Punk Carter that uh, bought a son of Playboy and a grandson of Playboy. And, you know, you just can't, that's, that's not the look anymore. Yeah. Playboys were big, big stoppers, but they all ran around with their head up in the air. And, you, I mean, you just can't do that anymore. Okay. So I think it's changed a lot. And, you know, where their horses look at something and go, what's that? Our horses just go, what? You know, I mean, it's just the difference of, of thought process. But yeah, The breeding definitely has played a big role. Our, our, I mean, our industry is more like, just like the racehorse business. I mean, they aren't bred with a pedigree, black type, top and bottom, you're still going to have your California chromes that aren't supposed to do what they do. They'll, they'll still show up, just they don't show up very often, you know. But um, breeding really has, um, like I said, they're easier to train. They're easier to work. Yeah. I mean, the horses that we, when I moved down here, the horses that we trained and showed probably wouldn't, they wouldn't, no, they wouldn't mess with them. They were too, too much work. And they were a lot of work, you know? What's, but What's one of the, <clears throat> and maybe like one of the first ones, or what's one of the worst one, worst horses you had that taught you the most that when you were first learning? Oh, no, oh, probably that buckskin that I talked about, ride a pink horse. Oh, ride a pink horse. <laughs> um... You know what, most, most of the horse, I've, ha I've had horses that certainly were, took a lot more work to train, but you only kept training on them because you felt there was a lot to, something there. There, there, there was something there that you knew that they were capable. If you could just get them to, get them trained, they were capable of winning. I can't tell you that it took a horse that didn't, I didn't think was any good right. and trained it and won on it. You know what I mean? I, I don't know. I just... I've, I've taken, I've had horses back then that I probably wouldn't train anymore today, but, um, you know, the ones that, I mean, I'm sure you guys same way. I mean, you didn't order to go out and spend that extra time on one day in and day out and ride through the heat of the day and work two, three times a day if they needed it. You only did it because you really felt like you knew there was something special there. It was just a matter of... Yeah, how to get yeah, yeah. Sure. man, train them. Well, Winston, thanks for stopping by. Joe's out of water, so when Joe yeah. we can't have Joe get dehydrated, yeah, so right when Joe's water glass is empty, it's time, it's to, time go. to go. It's time to it's at the end of our interview, and, and then you get old. I enjoyed it. It's good. Yeah, thanks for coming up. I really appreciate it. Enjoyed it. Always fun. All right. Until next time. Thank you, everybody.